My name is Nigel Cohen. Welcome to week six of this Sunshine course on accounting. Last week, we reviewed the key points that we dealt with so far. We reviewed the accounting process and we went through a number of practical examples. The idea was to try and get everyone to feel a bit more comfortable with what can be quite a sort of a theoretical or dry concept. And so often accounting makes much more sense when you do it. So sometimes it feels a bit difficult when you're listening to someone talking about it. But when you know what the transactions are, what the sales and purchases are, uh, what the particular uh, aspects of the business are, it's all very much easier. So hopefully some of the examples last week will have given you a slightly better feel, even though it's still a bit contrived. This week, we're going to talk about the balance sheet. And in order to look through the balance sheet, the first thing we have to do is to understand what we mean by accounting periods. There's a concept called the matching concept, which I want to explain, which is really at the heart of the balance sheet and a core concept of accounting. And if you're looking at other people's accounts, the matching concepts can be a bit confusing. And the better you understand the concepts, the easier accounting becomes. And then we're going to look at the balance sheet, which is the summary of all the balances once you've dealt with the matching concepts. So I want to start by talking about the accounting periods. You may remember when we very first started talking about these account this accounting, we said that the idea of accounts is to make sense of the higgledy-piggledy transactions that a business gets involved in. All the different income, expenses, paying for different things. What does it actually mean? What sort of sense does it mean? It's not enough just to know that you've received a net, say, £27,000 in the month. Why have you received that? Does it mean you've made profits or losses? What does it actually mean? What does it relate to? Well, the making sense of it we discussed falls into two parts. One part is you want to know what has moved during an accounting period. So the key part of this is during the period what has changed between, for example, the beginning of the month and the end of the month? And when we say what has changed, what we mean is, if we started off with a certain number of assets and liabilities, let's say we started off with 10,000 pounds in the bank, and at the end of the period, we've now got 15,000 pounds in the bank, what we mean is the accounts, the balances have changed during the month. And if we've done our double entry correctly, that extra £5,000 should be represented by profits or sales less purchases, less costs. And so what this chart is showing you is that we have in this particular period, we've got two accounting periods. One is the period from the 1st of January 2020 to the 31st of January, 2020, uh, 31st of December, 2020. So it's a whole year. And during that period, we've got various sales, various costs and the difference is profits. And similarly, at the end of the accounting, the, the second accounting period is from the 31st of December, 2020 to the 31st of December, 2021. So this is the second accounting period. Both of them are a year long. And what I wanted to show with this um, example is that we have sales. This big box with yellow is the sales during the period. The red box is the costs. And the difference between the costs and the sales is our profits. So we've talked about this in the past. And what the balance sheet says is we start off the period of beginning period, the 1st of January. We had a certain number of assets. We end up at the 31st of December, we have a different set of assets and the difference should be our profits or our, or our losses. Similarly, for the following accounting period, we have slightly more sales. Can you see this is slightly higher than the previous period? We've actually got slightly less costs. So delightfully, we have a bumper profits in the following year, 
But the key point of this chart is that we're talking about two accounting periods and we want to know what, are, what were the assets at the beginning of the period and that the assets at the end of the period. So I now want to move on, now we know what accounting periods are, to something called the matching concept. And what we mean by a matching concept is, if we receive or spend money, which accounting period does that money relate to? Now, in this particular example, we're paying out salaries. We're paying them out in the month of November. So you can see the, the dotted line, the, the blue dotted line with the gray in the middle represents the salary that we paid out. And we paid it out in the month of November. And all of that salary relates to costs in the month of November. So, so far, so good. Quite easy, quite instinctive, really. But we're now going to, to move on to paying rent. Now, in this particular example, we've paid rent of £5,000 over a three-month period. This is over the period from the 1st of October 2020 to the 31st of January 2021. It's a three-month period, and we paid the money on the 1st of October. So you can see the dotted line here is the 1st of October. And the end dotted line is the 31st of January 2021. So the payment happens to be on this date, on the 1st of, 1st of October. But the accounting period that related to is a three month period. And look, it falls into two accounting periods. It falls into the first part of it falls into the first accounting period for the year to the 31st of December 2020. And the next part is for the accounting period 2021. So the key point of this chart is to illustrate that this expense, this rent, it may have been all paid in December, October, November, whatever period it was paid in, but it relates to two accounting periods. So we're gonna have to work out how we account for that difference. And the final example I wanted to show you is a lease, which we paid out all of the money on the 1st of January, 2020. So it was actually quite a long time ago, but the lease for 20,000 pounds covered a two year period. So can you see the gray box has now been split over the whole of the two years? And we'll look at it in a bit more detail in just a minute, but the, um, the two year period um, we're actually going to split all of the £20,000, half of it into the first year and half of it into the second, because according to this chart, half of the lease should relate to the first year and half relates to the second year. So the question or challenge for the accounts, and this is what the balance sheet is all about, is how do we account for the fact we paid some money out in one accounting period, but the benefit is over a different accounting period. We paid the money in the first accounting period, but the benefit accrues over the two accounting periods. That's what the balance sheet accounting is all about, and that's what we're covering today. So I'll just give you an outline of what we're covering, and then I'll go into the detail. In outline, what we're going to do is we're going to review the trial balance, because the trial balance is the mechanism by which we account for these different timing periods, these different accounting periods. The fact we'll pay money or receive money in one accounting period, but the benefits or costs accrue over a different accounting period, possibly. We're then going to identify what are the future assets and liabilities, and we're then going to do what we've done in the past. We're going to journalize the changes, and we're going to create a trial balance. So I'm just now going to get the uh, spreadsheet for us. So bear with me one minute. Okay. So what I want to do is to illustrate the, um, the concepts we just talked about, the matching concepts uh, in a very slightly different format. Instead of in a graph format, this is in a spreadsheet format. And I just want to illustrate now a little, with a little bit more detail what we mean. But in this example, the first line is, we, we're talking about um, the cash book for the month of November. 
So all of the payments that we've made out, all receipts, were in the month of November. So November receipts and payments. And what I want to talk about is which accounting period do these relate to? So this is exa exactly the same as the previous chart. It's just I want to do it in numbers instead of in graphs. So the sales, uh, the first item that we've received, we received on the 15th of, of November, we banked a week's worth of sales. And the sales we banked for were for the week ending the 10th of, October, uh, 10th of November, 2020. So we paid the money out in November and it related to November. So the way we represent this in this spreadsheet is, this column here is the total payments in the month of November. And the 10,000 pounds relates to the week ended 10th of November, which means it's accounted for in the month of November. The following week, we had another week's worth of sales, which we banked on the 21st for the week ended the 17th of November, 9,500 pounds this time. This also related to November, so it was both paid out in November and it also relates to the month of November. Same thing with salary, we paid out on the 25th of, of November, a whole month's worth of salary, 5,000 pounds, and that relates to the month of November. So far, so good. But now, the 15th of November, we paid rent. So we've actually got two premises in this example. And one premises, we pay six monthly instead of monthly. And on the 15th of November, we paid out 900 pounds, which was the six months rent from the 1st of November to the 30th of April. Let me just highlight this. Even though we start the rent started on the 1st of November, we actually paid it on the 15th of November. So it goes in the November cash book. But what period does it relate to? And the answer is divide the 900 pounds by six, so that each month we pay 150 pounds. And the way I would allocate this is the first 150 pounds relates to the month of November, because if you look at the period that it relates to, it starts in November. And then we're going to apportion the 150 pounds to each of the months through to the end of April. Similarly, we paid a week later rent of another 900 pounds, but this was for a different premises, for a different lease, was for three months from the 1st of October. Sorry, I put that date wrong. This should be from the 1st of November to the 31st of January. Apologies, this, this just is, is dated wrong. Let me just correct it now. This three month period, and again, if it's 900 pounds over three months, I would allocate 300 pounds a month. The first month, irrespective of when we paid it, it happens to, we happen to have paid it in November, but the first month relates to the month of November. So I put 300 pounds in November, same thing in December, same thing in January. And the final thing, and this gets a bit more interesting, is on the 18th of November, we paid a lease of 24,000 pounds that related to a two year period from the 1st of November, 2020, right the way through to the 31st of October, 2022. The amount we paid was 24,000 pounds. So over a 24 month period, that really represents a thousand pounds a month. So here, when I do my allocations, I've allocated 1,000 pounds a month, but this is interesting. I paid out 24,000 pounds, but if I stop the clock as at the end of April, the 30th of April, I've paid out, I've used up 6,000 of the 24,000 pounds, but look, there's a further 18,000 pounds I haven't used up yet. I'm starting to give you a hint of what happened, what a balance sheet is all about. As it turns out in this particular example, if we were doing a balance sheet as at the 30th of April, we could say definitively that 18,000 pounds, as it happens of the 24,000 pounds, that's slightly academic, but 18,000 pounds has not yet been used up. So that's a balance to be carried forward for future periods. So what this spreadsheet shows you is the matching period where we're matching, we're originally listing out payments in a particular month, but now we're going to do something slightly different. We're going to match which accounting period 
the payment, the income or expense relates to. So here are the different accounting periods. This is which accounting periods they relate to. So I now want to talk about how this translates to something I think we're starting to get a bit more familiar with. I'm going to do record a trial balance. And I've split this trial balance into two accounting periods. There's a the month of January and the month of February. And the first bit I want to do is to do a little bit of a recap about a trial balance. But I also want to illustrate a couple of other things just to make you feel a bit more comfortable with the trial balance. And we actually start trading on February. We don't start doing anything, we don't start trading till February. But what we do is in the month of January, we get a lot of stuff ready. So in January, I've actually got four separate transactions and I've got a separate column for each transaction. And in the first transaction, and this information would all come from the cash book in this particular example. In the first example, the owners have injected 20,000 pounds. So the double entry we have for this is the money's gonna go into the bank account because it's an asset. If you remember, debtors are a debit. So a bank account will be a debit, it's a plus. We're going to put plus 20,000 pounds into our trial balance. We debit 20,000 pounds. Can you see at the bottom, our check sum is now 20,000 pounds because our double entry doesn't, uh, it doesn't balance, so we've got an error here. If we debit bank, what we're going to do is to credit the person who paid the money in, the, our, the owner. So we credit £20,000. So depending on the format in which the owner put the money in, it could be we simply owe the money to the owner, or it could be that the owner put in share capital. Either way, from an accounting point of view, we debit bank and credit whatever format the owner put the money in. So it might be share capital, it might be loan. In this case, it's share capital. We issued some shares. The second thing we did is we negotiated with a bank a loan of £25,000 because we know we want to buy £30,000 worth of assets, £35,000 or so, and we don't have enough money just from what's injected with the owner. So in the same month, in January, we got £25,000, which we paid into our bank from the bank by way of bank loan. So our bank account goes up by £25,000 or debit or plus £25,000. I'm using the simplified format because as I said, I find it much easier to follow. And we credit or we show a liability of the bank loan, we owe money to the bank. We then buy assets. So we're gonna take out 35,200 from the bank. That's credit bank. We reduce the bank minus bank, but we increase our assets. In this particular case, we bought 30,000 pounds of kitchen equipment and 5, 000, a car for 5,200 pounds. I just want you to note that as I'm putting these entries through, the balances as at the 31st of January are automatically changing. So I've automatically got 30,000 pounds because I set the formula up for it to work this way. Similarly, the car has gone up to 5,200 pounds. Look at the bank balance. We started off with nothing. We then injected 20,000 pounds. We put an additional amount of 25,000 pounds from a bank loan. We've paid out 35,200 in assets and we've got 9,800 left in the bank at this point in time. What I'm trying to illustrate is that you can use the trial balance as a live reckoning of all the assets and liabilities you've got at any one point in time. In this particular case, these are all the transactions we've entered so far as at the 31st of January. And then the final entry that we've got is we buy stock of 2,000 pounds so that we're ready to start business on the 1st of February. So I take out 2,000 pounds, Notice my bank, bank, bank balance of 9,800 goes down to 7,800 as soon as I put in the figure. I haven't put the other side of the entry so my checksum doesn't tally just yet. But I'm now gonna put the other side of my entry. We credited bank because it was the opposite of a debit. It's that we reduced the bank balance. So we have to debit something and what we debit is stock. 
So as at the 31st of January, we have a balancing balance sheet or balances. We show we got 30,000 pounds of assets, uh, of kitchen equipment, 5,200 pounds of car uh, assets, stock of 2,000 pounds. We still got 7,800 in the bank. And that's because we borrowed 25,000 from the bank and the owner has lent or issued share capital, uh, injected share capital of 20,000 pounds. So our trial balance is all very comfortable and we've actually not had any sales or purchases for the month because we haven't yet started trading. And I'm just gonna give you a sneak preview of the balance sheet. And again, I've created a balance sheet, although this says the 28th of February, we've only entered January transactions. So actually this is as at the end of January. The balance sheet simply formats the trial balance that we had here, all these figures, in a way that's a little bit more conventional. And in this case, we start off with our fixed assets. Kitchen equipment, you remember, was 30,000 car, 5,200, a total of 35,200. And for various reasons, we give a subtotal of all long-term assets. We then look at the short-term assets of our stock of 2,000 pounds and bank balance of 7,800. So our current assets are 9,800 pounds, but we've got liabilities of a bank loan of 25,000 pounds. Now I've shown this as a short-term liability because I'm assuming that we've negotiated an overdraft with the bank, which is repayable at any time. But if, we were, if that loan was instead of an overdraft, was say a loan over five years, then some of this liability would be short-term liability and some of it would be long-term liability. And in the balance sheet, we'd reflect that. We'll talk about that another time. But look, we've got net assets of 20,000 pounds. We've got our fixed assets of 35,000 pounds, current assets of 9,000 pounds, but we've got loans of 25,000 pounds. So our net assets of 20,000 pounds. And in theory, that money is owed to our owners. It's their money. And this is why these figures are credits. And this will make a bit more sense when we do sales and I'll explain it in a little bit of time. But what I wanted to say is that we've reformatted the trial balance uh, in a way that's more conventional. And this is called a balance sheet. On the balance sheet, we do not show the profit and loss account. We only show the totals of the profit and loss account. Okay, let's go back to our trial balance. And I'm going to enter a number of transactions that we have in February. I'm going to slightly speed this up. So in February, we do our trading. We've actually got 1,328 pounds of what looks like profits. This is money that's gone into the bank. And that, uh, uh, so our bank balance has gone up by uh, 1,328 pounds or debit or plus 1,328 pounds. And that's represented by sales of 38,305. Notice that's a credit. And we've got cost purchases of 36,977 pounds. Look at the totals have gone back to zero. So what this says is, if our bank balance has gone up by 1,328 pounds, it's because we've got sales of 38,300 pounds and costs of 36,977 pounds. And because this comes from our cash book, if I'd shown the cash book, we'd have shown all the individual transactions, we'd have allocated sales and costs between their various components and created a profit and loss account. But on the trial balance, I'm only showing the totals of the figures. Okay, uh, we've got unpaid sales. So what's happened is we've also sold 4,200 pounds worth of goods to someone who hasn't yet paid us. This might be we've done an office convention and we've cooked food for them and taken it to them and they haven't yet paid it. So they owe us money, they're a debtor. So we debit debtors of 4,200 pounds. The other side is we credit sales of 4,200 pounds. So we've actually increased our sales from 38,000 to 42,000 pounds. Look at the total here. Because we've got a debtor, we've got, we've invoiced somebody who hasn't yet paid us, but now through this miracle of double entry journals, we've included the sales that we didn't previously account for. So we're now expanding our cash book to show some additional entries. 
We've also got some purchases. We bought some uh, uh, stock, a thousand pounds worth of food that we haven't paid for yet. So because it's a creditor, we credit creditors, and this time we debit costs. This will go to our cost of sales if we had a full profit and loss account. But in this case, I'm just showing that the, the totals in the trial balance. We've got, we credit creditors and we debit costs because we've increased our costs. We've got an extra thousand pounds of food that we hadn't previously accounted for. So I'm now going to account for some asset depreciation. Some of this equipment, the 30,000 pounds, we've used up in February. We've actually used 3,000 pounds, which is quite a lot of money to, to use up. But for whatever reason, I'm going to reduce my kitchen equipment because we've used it up. It's a bad thing, it's a cost. So we reduce our assets, we credit our assets, is the opposite of the de debit. We credit our assets or reduce them. And we've got some costs, which happen to be the cost of, uh, cost of the equipment to 3,000 pounds. We credit kitchen equipment and we debit costs in the month. It's a cost to us, which we have to add to our other costs in order to identify what our true profit and loss account is. Similarly, we've used up some of the stock We've reduced the stock by 500 pounds, minus 500. We've reduced the stock, we credit stock, and we debit costs. Again, this would be part of our cost of sales. Even though we bought the stock in January, we've used it up in February. So during our matching concepts in January, we hadn't used any of the 2,000 pounds. So as at the end of January, we had the whole of that 2,000 pounds in our balance sheet. But yet in the month of February, even though we didn't pay out anything, we've used up some of that money. So even though we've got no cash outflow, we, we put a journal entry through to reduce our stock by 500 pounds and increase our costs by 500 pounds because we're reducing our profits. And then just quickly, repayments, we had some rent, we paid a little bit in advance. So at the end of whatever we paid out as part of these costs of 36,000 pounds, Whatever we paid for our rent, 250 pounds, was not yet used up when we did our matching. So we debit prepayments, and we this time we credit, we reduce our costs. And again, our balance sheet, our double entry balances, that's nice to know. And the final entry is an accrual. We've got various costs, which we haven't yet been billed for. We know we've got to pay it out. We've got 420 pounds of costs, so I'm gonna, we're going to owe that money to someone, even though they haven't yet paid us. We know it will be paid in a future period. And so I'm going to allocate the cost in this period, even though we haven't yet been billed and we haven't yet paid. And an accrual is the accounting mechanism by which you account for that cost, which you haven't yet been billed for, you haven't yet paid for, but you will be paid for it because you've had the benefit of whatever it is that was cost. It might be food that we used up that we haven't yet been billed for, that we've used, it's part of our costs, it's reduced our costs, reduced our profits rather, um, so we need to account for it. And so I now look at the balance sheet at the end of the period. When we account for the 30,000 pounds of kitchen equipment, less the assets we've used up, we're left with 27,000 pounds at the end of the period. Our car didn't change because we didn't depreciate it at all. For whatever reason, in, we're saying in these accounts, we didn't use up any of the cost. Our stock started off at the beginning of the accounting period of the 1st of January, uh, 1st of February. It reduced from 2,000 pounds to by 500 pounds because we used some up. So we've got 1,500 pounds left in stock. Our trade debt is a 4,200 pounds because we are owed money from that event who haven't yet paid us. We prepaid 250 pounds. We've still got 9,000 pounds in the bank. We've got 1,000 pounds of creditors. 420 pounds of accruals, we've still got our bank loan. Nothing's changed in terms of the cash injection, the share capital, but look what's happened. We've got sales, which we've adjusted for various entries of 42,000 pounds, and we've got costs of 41,000 pounds. So if I add those two together, I've highlighted the two. The two, we've got a credit, a negative of 858 pounds. We've got 858 pounds of profits. If we'd look just at the cash balance, it would look like we've got 1300 pounds of profits, but actually there were various costs and um, advanced payments, which changed the situation. It switched from 1300 pounds apparent profits to 800 pounds of actual profits because of all these journals. 
But look, the profits show as a negative figure. The sales are credits. And the reason for that, and this is, this is difficult to get your head around, and most people find it difficult to get their head around, but the rationale for all of this, for, for profits being a credit, is it's as if the extra assets that you've got in the company, the extra net kitchen equipment, bank balance, less creditors, the extra po positive balance of all of these, the asset is actually belongs to the owner. So just as the owner put in 20,000 pounds to begin with, and that was owed back to the owner, it's not a gift, it's a entry, it's, a, it's a, um, an injection of cash, which ultimately is repairable. We treat profits in the same way that the additional assets we've got are treated as if they belong to the owner. So the entry would be debit cash, credit owner, because the owner ultimately owns the profits. So this is why the profit and loss account looks back to front and profits which are a good thing are a credit, even though assets which are a good thing are a debit. So profits are the only thing that are, are this sort of quirk. And the quirk is because we deem the profits to belong to the owners. So it's a bit of a strange thing. I just wanted to revisit something we've discussed beforehand. And now look at these figures, 27,000 pounds of kitchen equipment, 5,000 pounds of car, 9,000 pounds in the bank. I've created a formula to drag these figures straight through to these reformatted balance sheets. And here we've got kitchen equipment of 27,000 pounds, car of 5,000 pounds, bank balance of 9,000 pounds. The total assets has gone up from 20,000 pounds at the beginning of the period to 20,858 20, pounds because we got this profit of 858, which is the difference between our sales and our costs. And I'm very happy that our total assets and our, the amount we owe back to our owner equal each other. So what we've covered in this meeting, in this uh, session, is an entry or a, a concept of accounting periods where we defined a beginning period, a during period, and an end period. The during period is accounted as a profit and loss account, which we've dealt with in previous weeks. And this week, we're starting to account for the beginning and the end period, the balances at the beginning and the balances at the end of the period, formatted in something called the balance sheet. And now we've got a more complete picture of accounts because for the first time, we've both got a profit and loss account and a balance sheet. And so we can now present to owners or to a bank or to anybody else that wants to know about our accounts, a more complete picture of what our uh, business looks like. So thank you for coming along to listen to this. Um, there's on the uh, Sunshine Courses website in the accounting section, there's exercises to do. And if you do the exercises, hopefully that will bed down a lot of what you've done. There's the presentation and there's also the spreadsheet we used. You might want to play with the spreadsheet because it's automatically set up with the balance sheet format. So if you wanted to play with it, to put in some other journals, to take out some journals and, and just to play around and see what happens with the balance sheet, it's quite useful, quite fun to be able to do that. So um, thank you for listening. Uh, have a go with these exercises, have a play around. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next week when we'll talk about uh, more detail of the balance sheet. Thank you very much. Bye.